My name is Brian Hoytland. I had a near-death experience. I was a military police officer in the United States Army, and I was exposed to toxic chemicals. And that eventually led to autoimmune diseases, one of which destroyed my heart. I eventually needed a heart transplant. I'll get into that as I tell my story. But what had happened was that I had an autoimmune disease that was eating away at my heart from the inside out, causing me to have life-threatening arrhythmias. This is a rare disease, and the aggressive nature of my disease was even more unusual. I went into cardiac arrest on January 16th of 2017, and during that time, I knew I was going to die. I'd been in the ER for 7 hours fighting for my life. They finally got me up to the ICU bed where they were going to intubate me and take care of all the ICU protocol. And I had another really bad arrhythmia run, so they called in the crash team and brought in the crash cart called Code Blue. And I could feel my body dying. They put me on this bed, which was, of course, the only thing I could see because there were doctors and nurses all around me. As a result, the only place I could see was at the foot of the bed. There was no activity down there. But there was a crucifix on the wall that really struck me. It piqued my interest. Of course, I couldn't move my head. They had me strapped down and were shocking me in order to keep me with them. But as I'm looking at this, I finally got the ability to pray. I was having a hard time praying during this time. I was worried about my sins and the things I'd done wrong because I wasn't a perfect person. So as I'm praying now, finally getting these prayers out, a sense of relief washed over me. I was ready to die. I knew I was going to die. There was nothing I could do to prolong it any longer, but I wasn't afraid. So I just sat there praying and talking with God, and I felt my body start to shake and pop, and my soul left my body. It was an incredible sensation. It was painful for that brief moment when I did the shake and pop, but the pain vanished as my soul left my body. The hospital room's noise and chaos came to an abrupt halt. I was in a quiet, dark void that immediately overwhelmed me with peace and love, pure joy. It permeated my entire being, and I was looking into this dark void as if I were standing in a tunnel, but looking off into what you'd think would be outer space. I didn't see any stars, planets, or luminous beings, but it was a vast, dark void. It was kind of hijacking the feelings of peace and love that I was having by almost forcing me to go into the dark void. But I could tell the love and peace didn't come from there. So I sat there thinking, well, this can't be it. But it wasn't like a human thought, where it's just one simple thought or maybe a complex compound thought. This was a specific thought that went through many layers of thought. And it wasn't just that this couldn't be it, but I didn't want anything without God. I didn't want to be filled with joy, peace, and love while staring into a blank, blank, dark void. I didn't want to go into that void either, so I took a look at it. As soon as I said that, I realized I was staring into a dark void and seeing depth. I was investigating it. I could see a long way into it. As a result, I knew there was light. And it was at this point that I realized I could see in 360 degrees. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was noticing that there was a light behind me all the time. And so immediately when I saw the light, I said, I want to see that light. As a result, I turned and I made an active physical motion to turn, despite the fact that I could still see the dark void behind me. As a result, I never lost sight of anything. I could see in 360 degrees, as I previously stated. But now that I'm looking at this light, I noticed how lovely and resplendent it is. It was fantastic. This light was so clear, and it only radiated love as if it were love itself. And I could feel it just pulsating into me. It was tangible. This love was so genuine that it went beyond any physical touch or emotion we can experience in life. As a result, I was overwhelmed. It was gushing into me. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, I want to be with that light. And I was there right away. That is, there was no G-force. There was no wind or other propulsion to make me feel as fast as I did. But I was fast. Just like that, I was there. It was amazing. So just seeing that, having that desire to be there, and I was there. What was interesting was that I could recall every step I took along the way. As a result, it gave me the impression that there was no concept of time, because I arrived as quickly as you could get the thought out. And yet, I took all those steps in order to get there. 
It was amazing. And it was a long journey. Now remember, I told you I could see 360 degrees. I too could see indefinitely. So I could see a distance that was incomprehensible. I am now in front of this light. And it was so beautiful, yet so powerful. Assume you're feeling a pulsating sensation from the light. That was the strength of this light. As a result, I was taken aback by how powerful it was. And it didn't bother my eyes. I was also looking in both directions, left and right. I also looked up and down. I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't seem to find the end of it. My vision, I was able to expand it. Like when you're following your vision and it's moving so fast. It was as if my vision was seeing things as it got further and further away from me. Nonetheless, I could see everything that it had already seen during the process. While looking forward and up and down, I was also looking at what I was looking at. So you had no limitations on your vision's ability. That was quite impressive. It was enjoyable to play with. But as I stand there looking at this light, I can't believe it doesn't hurt my eyes. That's when God told them that they could come in. So I walked right into the light. I entered this light, which was warm and full of love. It was a genuine embrace. It was as if God was hugging me. It's difficult to explain because I experienced a massive increase in my intelligence. So I understood things that I still don't understand. As a result, explaining it is extremely difficult. But this love was the kind that a parent would have if they could create their own child exactly how they wanted. This was a love greater than I have for my children. So I think you get the gist of it. But as I felt this love pulsing through me, the part that just overwhelmed me about God's love was that I felt like a straw. You envision a straw. It is drinking from a cup. You've gotten the liquid into the cup. This cup could go on forever. His love knows no bounds. So as I drink through a straw, the liquid rises through the straw and enters my mouth. However, the straw is never empty. It stays completely full the entire time I drink. That's how his love felt. It was as if I was that straw, and I was simply overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed by his love. And it was always new, always fresh, coming up through that cup. And the beautiful thing was that I felt like I would feel that love new and fresh for eternity because he's infinite. I could tell I was small in comparison to him. It was mind-boggling to see the difference. And when I felt his love pouring into me like that, I knew that was what we were going to do for the rest of our lives. We're going to drink in his affection. And it'll be new and exciting. It's not going to be dull. It's going to be the most exciting thing we've ever had because I loved it when I was there. When I'm looking at what I had saw from the love of God, I would stay in the sewer for all of eternity with all of the gross things that come along with that just to experience his love. That's how amazing it was. I told Jesus I wanted to see him when I was feeling this way. That's when the light came on and I saw this fantastic room. And this room was enormous. It was as large as or larger than the dark void I saw. But I could see this clearly defined. And there we were. I can't even imagine how many beings there were in this room. But imagine an endless sea of beings. And they were all glistening with a beautiful light. A magnificent light similar to the light of God that I had seen enveloping this place. However, it was not as bright. There was clearly a hierarchy, but there was one being who was brighter, more resplendent, and more complete and beautiful than the others. This had to be Jesus. I knew it. Although I couldn't see his face at this point, my soul was drawn to him. There's no doubt that this being was madly in love with me, and that it was the source of my soul. That connection was palpable to me, so I looked him in the eyes and said, Jesus, I want to see your face. And as soon as I said that, his face began to blend. This is the part that I'm most interested in because, as a psychotherapist, I'm fascinated by consciousness. I'm interested in certain aspects of how the mind functions. Now, with my mind having been dead and was back in the hospital room, I had no limits on my mental abilities. It was excellent for me, but it was interesting to see how his face appeared and I could see his face, but it was as if it was animated. You know how you can flip a little book with a bunch of different shapes on it and they appear to move? That's similar to how it was. It was getting into my eyes, but it wasn't sticking around. 
I couldn't remember what his face looked like because I didn't have a memory of God. So as soon as his face appeared, I forgot about it. I have no idea why he did that. I don't know if that was to protect me or if it was just, I wasn't worthy. I have no idea. Then again, who doesn't? But what I do know is that I didn't get to see his face, but I did see what it looked like. And he was smiling at me, his eyes filled with love. Even while we were discussing my life review, he exuded love through his appearance and features. I mean, I've been through a lot in my life. I was far from perfect. I did things that I'm ashamed of. But while I was ashamed at the time, I was sorry for them. And those were not held against me as seriously as some of the others that I truly validated. And I made excuses for why I did these things. And they harmed Jesus. All the sins had been applied to him and his passion, but the ones I really held on to, the things I did wrong, especially towards other people, and that I justified because I thought I deserved better, were the ones that hurt him the most. So, while we're at it, I'd like to point out that time in heaven was not a continuum. It wasn't like the series of stories I'm telling now. It resembled a pin dot. Everything that has ever happened throughout history can be found in a pin dot, and it is all happening at the same time, never ending, always the same. It's insane. It's beyond our comprehension because we live on a continuum. We live in a time frame. We grow old and have that kind of life experience, but heaven isn't like that. So while I was doing this in heaven, we were all doing it at the same time. So if that makes sense, please stick with me. It's difficult to put into words. I hope I'm doing well enough, but I wanted to bring this up because Jesus was teaching me every step of the way during my experience. And one of the three lessons he taught me was that I needed to pray more. Every day, I recite the rosary. It's fantastic. It's a wonderful prayer, but it's not the only thing I need to pray for. It is also doing good for others. It's a job. There are things I can do to help someone. I can smile at someone who, you know, I don't have anything else to offer them, but they appear to be in need of a smile. That is not a difficult thing to do. So there are many ways for me to live a life of prayer, but it's always living knowing that I'm doing my best for God. If I prioritize Him and devote everything I do for Him, my life becomes a prayer. So that's what He was trying to teach me about how to live my life. Another thing He said to me was to suffer joyfully. I have a severe autoimmune disorder. I eventually needed a heart transplant. And when they took out the heart for the transplant, the doctor said there was no way I should have been operating. It shouldn't have been working at all. This is a devastating disease that I suffer from. As a result, I had to suffer for many more years. And I was expecting it. I knew it was going to be difficult. But what Jesus showed me was that He's God and He came down from heaven for us. He didn't have to suffer, but if he went to the cross and died for us, what should I expect? And it's not that he said I had to suffer, that that was always going to be the case. But life is difficult, and he was showing me how properly handling it reflects generosity and love to the rest of the world. Holding on to my pain and suffering, becoming bitter and agitated becomes a curse to the rest of the world. And this is how he expects us to live. We don't have to like the suffering. But to suffer joyfully means that we accept what comes our way because there are no guarantees in life. So this was a really important lesson, especially coming back and having far more pain than when I died because of all the process of attempting to save my life. The last thing he said to me was that I had to share this love. That was a fairly simple task, but it was not without difficulty. He wanted me to spread this joy to everyone, and it doesn't matter if they agree or disagree with me. He wants me to share His love with them so that they can see the beauty, kindness, and caring love that He has for them. So at this point, Jesus said it was time for me to return. So I started to make my way back, and I had to go back through the exact same route that I'd come in. After that, I stepped back out of the light and saw my tunnel. And I could see that the light at the end of my tunnel was no longer a dark void. It was my hospital room and I could see all of the doctors and nurses working on my body, and it appeared that I was seeing it from the back of my head, almost through my own eyes, but I could see my entire head, so it wasn't like I was looking through my eyes. But as I looked around, I noticed they had this Lucas machine on me, 
They were performing CPR on me in an attempt to revive me. They had a lot of oxygen on me. They were putting my brain to test. That's a long time without brain or heart activity. They were concerned that I would develop brain issues and cognitive deficiencies as a result of this. Fortunately, I haven't had any of that. But when I returned to my body, I snapped back into place and spontaneously revived as the doctors described it. But I popped up as much as I could. Being strapped down makes it difficult. And I yelled to the doctor with whatever oxygen I had in my lungs through the mask. Did I just die? And this was a strange question for me because I never believed in NDEs. But as a psychotherapist, I'm looking at this and saying, I know I just died. I died, but I didn't lose consciousness. This is where I wanted to make sure it wasn't an out-of-body experience and that I was actually dead. And the doctor came forward again because it was too quiet to hear me. And he said, yes, you died. When I said it the second time, and that was so powerful to me because I knew I had experienced this, but for some reason, I needed that confirmation. And the entire experience has shown me that there is so much love out there and it comes from God. He is the source of love, but we are blind to it. And I can't live my life like that anymore because I saw how I was interfering with the process of love flowing down from God and out to others. In my experience, I was not that open straw. I didn't have the resistance and I didn't have all the distractions that come with life. So it was simple to love God and return His love. And I believe that is the goal of what we must do in life. So that's what I'm trying to do with my life right now. I try to live my life trying to show love to others, making sure that every interaction I have shows them how much God loves them because nothing else matters to me. It's not about my ego anymore. It's not about picking a restaurant, a movie, or a route to work. Those things aren't particularly important to me. Even in my own career, I've given up the ambitious desire to advance and become more prestigious in my therapy and practice. Instead of going in a different direction, I've decided to work with the homeless because of my experience. I wasn't this kind before, I guess, but now I want to help them. They don't have anything to offer me. And this is the lovely thing. They don't try to act like they do. They're simply in pain. And I discovered a place where I can express my love. That is my goal. That's where I'm going to focus my career for the rest of the time God has given me.